Alright, so today we're going to focus on Chon Noriega's beautiful identities. And we're also going to think a little bit more about the categories that we're using in this class and the ways in which they're getting used. Okay, so Chone Noriega's Beautiful Identities provides a brief history to the ability for not just uh, Chicano and Latinos, but also Asian Pacific Americans and African Americans to find representation on television. This all came as a result of the 1960s civil rights movement struggles that specific forms of legislation were created such that there could be the possibility of representation, which also then caused the cultural movement to really start thinking about the fact that the sorts of representations out there didn't reflect our actual social realities. And oftentimes, the representations of difference were used in very pernicious sort of ways to generate fear or to generate comic relief without ever adding in a sense of critical reflexivity to be able to understand those as ironic. So for example, the egregious stereotypes that are purported throughout minstrelry or the early era of Hollywood cinema. All right. So what we get in Beautiful Identities is this play between identity and difference. Those of you in American studies know that these are two key categories for thinking about the dynamics of social and cultural life, thinking about issues of sameness, community, and identity in relation to, and not against, uh, issues of constructed difference and the social construction of identity categories. So the key is not to have all identity and not to have all difference. Because if we strive for all identity, then we end up with sorts of things like the Americanization programs that immigrants had to go through at, in the early 20th century. And we don't want all difference because we do need to coexist. And part of the social project of American studies is thinking about ways of coexistence in which there is mutual understanding and not just exchanges of violence or disharmony. So thinking about a healthy balance of identity and difference. So what we get in Beautiful Identities, and this is Noriega's more theoretical argument as opposed to the historical argument, is that on the one hand, there is a lot of political activity that went into the construction of identity categories. He details how the category Chicano cinema is a direct result of what media activists were putting out there and unified under that sort of title. But then he also talks about how that category became the only way that people could understand the contributions of Chicanos. And we're understanding, of course, that Chicano is a term that came out of the California's, uh, California Brown Power Movement in the 1960s, naming us, uh, coming up with a category that referred to the fact that what we now know as the West was Mexican land before it was colonized by the US. So we're thinking about, on the one hand, the construction of identity as a result of like inter-community struggles, but then also thinking about how those identity categories get appropriated. And so that's what, the, that's what Noriega means when talking about the state. When we're talking about the state, we're not talking about government. That's a separate issue. When we're talking about the state in this sense, in reference to categories, we're thinking about particular ways of thinking that reflect the sort of generalizability and demographic lumpings that take place under the purview of governance. So then, this is where we need to be particularly critical about all the different nationalities and ethnicities and identities that get lumped under the categories Asian Pacific American and U.S. Latina Latino. So, I want to explain a little bit more about Noriega's argument. So, as we talked about in week one, for example, talking about television and museums, so much depends on the context. And when we're thinking, on the one hand, about the difference between high aesthetic culture and low popular culture, but it also depends when we're thinking about representation itself in terms of is it a community identity or is it a produced image ex uh, externally imposed from the outside. So we have to think about the work of institutions and that's a lot of what Noriega does in talking about the different institutions and organizations that oversee but also contest the types of representations that are available on television. And so on page 257, when Noriega talks about Chicano cinema as a category, he has that statement about beauty or purpose, right? First of all, beauty is always put to instrumental use. Secondly, all that is perceived based on one's vantage point is either beauty or purpose. And thirdly, the state, and remember we're talking about the state as a particular way of thinking, the state is what holds these two together. So remember that 
four-sided chart that we've been going over. On the one hand, politics and capital, and on the other hand, affect and aesthetic. So that's what we're talking about. If we're talking about purpose, we're looking at that horizontal axis of the slide between capital and the meanings that are produced, right? Money making are the meanings that are produced. And if we're thinking about the aesthetic, we're thinking vertically about, on the one hand, those types of feelings and experiences that come about as a result of a particular representation. And on the other hand, the types of expectations and beauty that we experience as a result of a particular text or object or practice. So we're thinking about both of these together as a challenge to what Noriega says about typically it's only understood in terms of purpose or beauty. And so now I have a series of words behind me that all kind of fall under this purview of identity and difference. So we're keeping in mind that change is not a natural thing, and we're also keeping in mind that the construction of difference is not a natural thing. So this is why Noriega begins with the 1960s, even though he's writing in the late 1990s. Because change is not a natural thing, but because of the role of hegemony, we don't think that change actually happens except over the course of time. We lose sight of all the actors and all the specific, for example, court cases, protests, and campaigns that go into changing what has been accepted as hegemonic meaning. We can also see this in Nancy Ewan's performing race negotiating identity, right? When we're talking about the actors and the very complicated forms of agency that they exercise. These are not just natural things. These are very specific decisions that, of course, go across these lines of, on the one hand, politics and capital, and on the other hand, affect and the aesthetic. So, what I want to do here is unpack the meanings that we put in race when we're talking about identity and difference. I also really want to complicate what we're talking about when we talk about stereotypes, because I've seen at least four different definitions over the discussion board, and I don't really feel like we're all having the same conversation yet. So, on the one hand, we think about race in terms of these three kind of broad categories. On the one hand, the demographic, because even though race is just a result of phenotype, we give it so much demographic meaning. So if we're talking about demographics, we're talking about very careful surveys of common trends and common issues that saturate an entire community or population, right? Demographics referring to demography, referring to the study of the people. However, sometimes we get sloppy and go for the empirical. For example, the model minority myth that I had us all discuss in week one. How large is your sample size when you're making these generalized statements about, for example, Asian Americans being good at math or Asian Americans having oppressive parents? And the same applies for talking about Latinos because we also ended up talking about the stereotype of 